Probably one of the best things we humans have ever done for ourselves is the discovery of coffee. We can't imagine how people lived back in the day without this aromatic beverage to power them through the mornings. But can you believe this liquid elixir goes through a lot of processing before it becomes as it is? Hey guys, how have you been doing? Welcome back once again to our channel. On today's episode, we'll be talking about the long, arduous process of making coffee. And believe us, coffee harvesting is harder than you think. Hopefully, by the end of this video, you'll find a deeper appreciation for this beverage and salute the workforce behind this. But before we get started, make sure you've already hit that like button. And while you're at it, subscribe to our channel as well with the notification bell on, so you'll be notified as soon as we upload a new video. Where did coffee come from? Coffee is prepared by roasting the beans from a certain genus of flowering plants called coffea. No one knows exactly when coffee originally came to be, but the earliest record of coffee was discovered in modern-day Yemen and southern Arabia in the middle of the 15th century in Sufi shrines, where coffee seeds were first roasted and brewed like how it is now prepared for drinking. These coffee beans were believed to be procured from the ancient coffee forests of the Ethiopian plateau, and legends say that coffee Kaldi, a goat herder, discovered the potential of these coffee beans. Kaldi shared his findings with the abbot of a local monastery, of which the latter concocted a drink from these berries. Later on, the abbot found out that the drink kept him awake that night throughout the long hours of evening prayer. With this discovery, he shared it with the other monks in the monastery, and thus, news of the energizing drinks spread across the land and eventually across the world. How does coffee come to be? Before it becomes your favorite go-to drink in the morning, coffee undergoes several processes to become the drink that you enjoy. First, there's planting. Every coffee beverage starts from being a seed. The coffee plant, the genus of the plant where coffee seeds are derived from, is usually planted in shaded nurseries and watered regularly. These seeds do well in the shade and in indirect sunlight. Planting season takes place during the wet season for the soil to be in moist condition so the roots can be firmly established. Once the seeds have sprouted, they are transferred to individual pots that have soil with carefully formulated minerals to enhance their growth. With frequent watering, they can grow continuously until they are finally transferred to their permanent planting grounds, harvesting cherries. After planting, you might want to wait a while since it takes approximately three to four years before the plants bear fruit. Fruits from these plants are typically called cherries, and their color is a signal of how ripe they are, with green for unripe ones and red for the ripe ones, ready for picking. Under lower altitudes and higher temperatures, the cherries start to ripen. Of course, the cherries need to be harvested, which can be done manually by using hands or with the help of a machine. Preferably, hand-picking cherries is an optimal solution to check the ripeness, but it involves a lot of labor and is also an intensive process. Another thing worth noting is that cherries don't mature at the same time. They have different ripe maturity, that's why hand-picking is preferred, but costly at the same time. Picking cherries has two options, strip picking and selective picking. Strip picking. With strip picking, the cherries are stripped off the branch by using hands or by using a machine. Selective picking. Selective picking, on the other hand, is when red cherries are picked while the green ones are left to ripen. This picking method takes place at 10-day intervals and is very labor-intensive, since it is mainly used to pick high-quality Arabica coffee. Like rice, harvesting coffee takes place once a year in several countries, but other countries do two harvests per year, like in Kenya and Colombia. The pick of the middle season is usually the best, while the first and last harvest has a poorly developed flavor. Processing cherries. Now that the cherries have been picked, the next thing they undergo is a processing, which is executed as soon as possible to avoid being spoiled. There are two methods to process cherries, dry and wet methods. Dry method. By using the dry method, freshly picked cherries are laid out in open land and left to dry out under the sun for 15 to 20 days usually. The cherries are put on drying beds that are slightly elevated to ensure that the air circulates around the berries where they are regularly raked and turned to avoid fermentation and for them to dry properly at night. The berries are covered to avoid moisture from seeping in. The dry method is used in regions with a scarce water supply and is also called unwashed or natural process processing and is popularly used on small-scale farms. The dry method has been around for a long time and is known to be used in earlier times. This method is highly dependent on the weather, since drying cherries may take several days to a few weeks for the moisture content to drop to less than 11%. By then, the outer layer of the cherry has dried up, 
turning black and brittle, which is easier to remove. Wet method. The other method is called the wet method because it involves using water. The wet method is relatively new compared to the dry method, and as we said earlier, it makes use of water. What happens is that the cherries are put through a pulping machine that squeezes out the skin without damaging the bean. Coffee beans are naturally very hard, so this process doesn't damage them at all. If some berries are left in the pulp, then it just means that they aren't ripe yet, but these don't go to waste and instead are used to make lower quality coffees. Coffee pulping leaves mucilage, which is then put into large tanks with enzymes being added to help get rid of the sticky substance. Beans are put in large tanks and stirred often to ensure all the mucilage is dissolved. The entire process takes approximately 24 hours. It's important to remove all the mucilage to ensure beans are left with the flavor that was developed before this processing. After it has dissolved, the beans are washed repeatedly to remove any leftover stickiness. The naked coffee beans are then dried in the sun for a day or two. Bean drying. Now that the beans are processed, they are left out to dry. The beans that are being dried are still inside the parchment envelope, also known as the endocarp. These beans can be sun-dried by spreading them on drying tables or on floors, where they are turned regularly, or they can be machine-dried in large tumblers. The dried beans are known as parchment coffee and are warehoused in jute or sisal bags until they are readied for export. Bean milling. Now that they're in parchment coffee form, they need to go through several other processes to reach the market and export. Hulling. First, they need to remove the dried husks in the parchment coffee by a process called hulling. Polishing. Next, we have polishing, which is a step that's skipped by some millers. It involves getting rid of any sliver skin that may have found its way through hulling. Polished beans are considered to be of a higher quality than unpolished ones. Grating and sorting. After polishing comes grating, where the beans are laid out and then grated and sorted by size and weight. At the end of the milling process, only the finest beans are packaged for sale to the high-end markets. In some countries, the lower quality beans are not discarded. Instead, they're taken for processing and sold as low-quality coffee. Bean exporting. Now that the beans have been grated and sorted, they're now ready to be exported. They're no longer called milled beans, but they are now referred to as green coffee. Green coffee is then packed and loaded onto ships in sisal or jute bags, loading into shipping containers, cupping, or coffee tasting. Once they've arrived at their destination, coffee is then repeatedly tested for quality, which is called cupping, and takes place in a room designated to facilitate the process. A taster, called a cupper, evaluates the bean first for its quality, and, right after, these beans are roasted and boiled in a controlled environment. Samples from different batches are tested daily, and an expert cupper can taste and differentiate hundreds of coffee samples in a day. Roasting. Now that they've passed quality control, green coffee is then roasted to the aromatic brown beans we know they are, that cafes from around the world purchase to make their own signature coffees. When the bean reaches an internal temperature of around 400 degrees Fahrenheit, they begin to turn brown and the caffeol, a fragrant oil locked inside the beans, begins to emerge. This process, called pyrolysis, is the heart of roasting. It produces the flavor and aroma of the coffee we drink. There are also different types of roasts, namely light, medium, and dark. Light roasts do not produce any oil on the surface of the coffee beans. Beans are light, or a moderate light brown color. Medium roast beans are a medium light to medium brown color and are developed during the first crack. The dark roasts produce dark charred beans that have a lot of oil on the surface. Dark roasts happen after the second crack. Depending on the roasting temperature, the color varies from medium dark brown to nearly black. Roasting coffee takes place near where the consumer is, since as soon as the beans are roasted, they start to lose their good quality. Grinding. Last but not least, we have the grinding process, which determines the most flavor in a coffee cup. The type of grinding determines how fast the coffee can release its flavors, and is why espresso coffee is so finely ground. And there you have it. As soon as you've ground your coffee, then it's ready for brewing. All in all, coffee harvesting is a long process and takes a lot of manpower to fulfill. So the next time you're having a cup, be grateful to all the hands that made it possible for you to enjoy that cup. That's all we have today on why coffee harvesting is harder than you think. Don't forget to smash that like button before you go, and subscribe to our channel with the notifications bell on for more content like this. We'll see you again next time, and thanks for watching.